Thanks, Titus. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. Thank you for those who've been praying for uh, Rachel Britton down in Texas. Uh, I told you her, uh, I put an email prayer request out there for her, and I actually put something out on Facebook, our Facebook page. And uh, I guess uh, her son Henry lives down in Texas, and she does too. And her, it was the, the, the fire destroyed 80% of her son Henry's neighborhood. Two houses were spared. Guess which two houses? His and another person's. Imagine that. And uh, so there was an answer prayer. And then um, it, uh, it was 15 miles away from her place, their church. They, so they were all, they, they, it didn't get near them, so they're all set. So thank you for your prayers for those who are praying for them. And uh, we're going to, uh, if you could turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. Next week we'll be finishing off uh, chapter 5. And I've been uh, thinking about what uh, what will be the next book in the Old Testament that we're going to have an in-depth study, you know, our in-depth study during the week. And our, our, uh, the, uh, the study on Sunday is uh, going through the different books of the Bible is, is less in-depth. Uh, but during the week, the next, uh, after First Timothy, when we finish that, I'm thinking of doing the book of Joel. Um, I don't know yet. We'll see. Uh, it's either that or Daniel. I'm really, I really like that. I'm really itching to do Daniel. So we might end up doing Daniel. It's, it's a toss-up between Daniel and Joel. But that could, you know, something could change real quick, too, on that. And so we'll see. Depends on what God has me do. So I'm looking forward to that new study. And then this Sunday, we begin our study of that new series that will be take place every Sunday, Journey Through the Bible. It's a less in-depth study. We'll be able to cover more ground. So we're going to start off with the book of Exodus because we did Genesis in the past. And we're going to be doing Exodus chapter 1, the entire chapter, uh, this coming Sunday. And then we'll, go roll, we'll roll through the chapter. We'll send some chapters. Sometimes we'll be able to take more than one chapter. Uh, depends on what's in the passage. So I think you're going to really, uh, some people are going to really enjoy that. So the people who like the in-depth study, they get what they need, and the people who have uh, that uh, don't need such an in-depth. I think everybody does at some point going to need in-depth, but uh, you know, just to get the good. Uh, it's going to be good for people who are, you know, who like the in-depth study. It's going to be fun for them. I know it's going to be fun for me because we get to go through the different books of the Bible. At least we get a, a good uh, a summary overview of each of the books of the Bible. So that's going to be a lot of fun. To begin that this Sunday, and. Um, was it Sunday is the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and that's something that that went by fast. I can't believe 10 years has passed. I had just moved out to Iowa when that happened. It was pretty interesting. A lot of things have gone under the bridge. A lot of water has gone under the bridge. All right, uh, 1 Timothy 5.24. We're going to study uh, 1 Timothy 5.24 this evening, which is going to resume uh, Paul's discussion about the ordaining of men to the ministry, ordaining men to be overseers, uh, to hold the office of overseer. And uh, he's going to uh, talk about, in verse 24, he's going to teach that the sins of some men are conspicuous, meaning very obvious. However, indeed, the, some, the sins of other men who aspire to the office of overseer, their sins appear later on in their lives. They're not conspicuous. And uh, then next Tuesday, in verse 25, Paul's going to conclu conclude this discussion of the uh, ordaining of men to the ministry by noting the good works of some men are conspicuous and then there's some that are not conspicuous. And the whole idea, as we'll see this evening and on Tuesday, is that they, Timothy and other pastors who are, or, who are involved in the process of ordaining men to be overseers, they have to be very cautious and uh, because some, sin, the, uh, some things that men are doing, sinful lifestyles of men are, are hidden and, but if you're around them long enough, you take the time and, and, and uh, observe the, uh, the principles that he taught in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 about uh, the qualifications that men must meet to receive, be installed in the office of overseer. They had a, over an indefinite period of time, manifest those characteristics, those qualifications on a consistent basis over an indefinite period of years, those qualifications that we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7. So this is, a, again, a very important study because it's going to tell us uh, you're going to be informed as how to the church. See, some people say, well, this is related to a pastor. You know, it's like, well, no, it's related to people in the congregation. People in the congregation should know what's required of pastors so that, that way they can select the church, in the, in for one. But also you, you should know what's the process in uh, disciplining elders and anybody in church discipline. You should know that. And then also, you should know that you should be uh, men who have, uh, when I'm ordaining, if I go to ordain somebody, I have to be very cautious 
and ordaining men to the ministry. So uh, you need to know that as well because you're going to be involved in the ordination process at some point. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, because you, you have to be observing of this man's life who wants to be a pastor, an overseer over a church. And again, the overseers can only be those men with the gift of pastor teacher. So it's important for the body of Christ. And I, I think it's uh, extremely important now because, I, I, quite frankly, a lot of men, uh, I mean, they're just, taking the, uh, they're just taking the office of overseer so lightly. And it, the authority is being attacked at the office. And, and one of the reasons why is just so many men are in, in the ministry that probably shouldn't even be in the ministry. Some of them don't even have the gift to pass the teacher. Uh, it's evident by the fact that they don't teach. Um, some men, they just don't have the maturity level to get to, to be in that position. And so uh, this is a study I think that's going to give, it was designed, this teaching here in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, was designed to give Timothy and in particular the church in Ephesus, the leadership there, discernment as to, uh, you know, who should be, who's ready for the ministry and who's not. How do you determine that? And you have to observe the man's life. You have to investigate the man's life. Now, I'm not saying, you know, you're over his house, you know, 24-7. I mean, you, over a period of years, you see if this guy's involved in the ministry and how does he conduct himself? And what is he like in his personal life? What is he, I mean, you gotta, it's important. You need to know that. I mean, people you pull the doctrine of privacy, and they always like that as the sacred cow, but they abuse the doctrine of privacy. Uh, we need to know. You need to know about, I mean, for instance, when I came out to Iowa, you know, they should check. They should have checked on me. They should go to my church and say, and they talk to some people in our church. Check on who, who I am as a person. You know, GBC saw me for over ten years, and I mean, if they ordained me, you know, and, and nobody disagreed with it, then I mean, you're gonna. I mean, they, people, you should know if you got. For instance, you're selecting a pastor. You should know about the guy. If you not, know nothing about the guy, I would hesitate to even ordaining him, or excuse me, uh, having him as your pastor. You gotta know something about this guy. And uh, if you know somebody who you, you can respect their opinion and they give you a good idea about this guy who's candidating for your church, then great. But uh, And you can count on his, he's got good discernment, great. But uh, be very, we need to be very careful when we're ordaining men to the ministry. And everybody's in a rush. And I know guys in the ministry, I know when I was, you know, I was, you know, looking, uh, you know, looking to uh, serve God. And sometimes in your zeal to serve God, you know, some people, uh, the ordained men, you know, they, they see this guy zealous, but the guy needs to just sit back and cool his heels and relax a little and not be in such a rush. Everything is, happens in God's timing, and God's timing is perfect, and so the man who's got the gift to pass the teacher, like all of us, needs to know that and understand that. Well, let's, uh, that's, uh, let's take the moment of silent prayer, so with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this great privilege that you've given us to study your word. It's a fantastic, awesome privilege that we can have fellowship in your word, Father, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who makes it possible for us to have the Bible. We thank you for the, his inspiring the human authors of Scripture to put down in perfect, with perfect accuracy in the original languages your complete and connected thought to mankind. We just thank you, Father, for... Uh, the Spirit's work in our lives from regeneration to resurrection. And we also thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for his death and resurrection and giving us the victory over sin and Satan. We just thank you so much for all the blessings that we have, not only in the temporal realm with food, shelter, and clothing, and the jobs we have, and the cars we have, and the, the salaries, salaries that we've been given. We thank you for the bodies that have been given to us. But we also thank, thank you, Father, for the spiritual blessings that were crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with your Son, and we are now children of yours, and we're sons of God, and what a great and awesome privilege that we've been given. So help us to live in a manner consistent with our position in Christ, 
to walk by faith and not by sight, to trust in you, to know that you and your son Jesus Christ controls history, and therefore not only the different countries of this world that are under the deception of Satan, but also the individual lives of all people. We just know that you're, we know that you're from the testimony of the scripture, that you're very much concerned uh, in each of our lives, and in the lives of our children. And we lift up uh, Jody's daughter at this time. We just pray, Father, for her and just give her the answers that she's uh, looking for and protect her from the attacks of the enemy. We just uh, help Jody at this time. And uh, we just pray, Father, that you would bring glory to yourself uh, with uh, her, your, her daughter. And we also, Father, we just uh, pray for other individuals, other young people that are, uh, especially in the colleges and universities or even in the high schools, that are being uh, attacked with uh, false, uh, the lies of Satan's cosmic system. So help us to help these individuals, these uh, individuals, these young people, and use these situations to lead them to your word, to get the answers from the word of God, and uh, stop messing around with the lies of Satan's cosmic system. Get serious about their relationship with you through the study of your word, and be feeding uh, their souls with the word of God so that they can grow stronger. And help us all to do that in the body of Christ, us adults, and to make sure our priorities are, are right, so that we might be a good example for our children and other believers. We pray that this evening's class, that everything would go smoothly with the technology and the sound and the recordings. And uh, also, we pray, Father, for Titus, give him wisdom and uh, in that area. We thank you for his, his work, Father. We thank you for the Thompsons, Titus and Jody, opening up their homes to us and home to us. We just thank you for them and, and everyone here this evening and also on Pal Talk and viewing this class and listening to this class through the website. We pray that you would help all those in the audience to concentrate, help them to make proper application, help them to be humble, and uh, we just pray that you would give grace to myself, help me to concentrate, and to deliver your people everything that you want them to hear this evening. And we pray that as a result of this class, we'd have a great time fellowshipping in your word and continuing to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that this class would also bring glory to you and your Son. So we pray for these things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24, the Apostle Paul resumes his discussion from verse 22, in which he taught Timothy that he's not to ordain a man too hastily to the office of overseer. Remember, that only the men with the gift of past the teacher can hold the office of overseer. Because We know that because one of the qualifications for an overseer was he had to be a skillful teacher. Able to teach actually is... Uh, it means skillful in teaching, as we saw. So, and the deacons didn't have that qualification because they don't have that. They, they don't have that gift. So, only those who have the gift of teacher. Uh, in Ephesians 4:11, they call, Paul calls him pastor teacher. Uh, the word pastor is designed uh, to express his authority, and teacher talks about his function, how he exercises that authority over the body of Christ. So, only those men with the gift of pastor teacher can assume the office of overseer. Paul calls these men also presbyteros, which, mean, which is translated in the English uh, Bibles as pre, uh, elders. So they're synonymous with overseers in this epistle, and they are as well in, in Acts chapter 20 and many other places. So in verse 24, Paul resumes this discussion about, uh, in verse 22, in which he taught Timothy uh, that he is not to ordain a man too hastily, and if he does, he's going to be involved in the complicit in the sins of these men if they go into apostasy. Now, here in verse 24, Paul presents the reason why this is the case, that they should not, Timothy and the Ephesian leadership should not ordain men too hastily. And he teaches that the sins of some candidates are conspicuous. However, the sins of some men don't show up later on in their, until later on in their lives. So what he's going to tell us in this verse is that when we're going to ordain men, don't be hasty in ordaining them. Verse 22 says, because you'll be complicit in their sins, and you'll be disciplined by God for it. But also he goes for another reason in verse 24, after the parenthetical note in verse 23 about Timothy's help. In verse 24, he gives another reason why he shouldn't ordain men too hastily, because uh, some men, their sins are, cons uh, some candidates, their sins are conspicuous, but others, they're not conspicuous. They don't show up until later on in their lives. So the imp implicitly, he's teaching them, so give it time. If their sins, sinful lifestyles of some candidates haven't appeared yet and shown up in their lives yet, 
it will eventually, over time, you'll see this manifested. So give it time. Don't be in a hasty. Don't be hasty in ordaining men. And as I said before, I really believe this. One of the problems that's going on in the church today is, and I, I think it's almost tied to the, the seminary thing too, and I'm not against seminaries, but I think, and I talked about this uh, earlier in the week, you know, uh, four years in a seminary and learning Greek and Hebrew, you know, first of all, you're not going to learn everything to know about Greek and Hebrew in four years, I'll tell you right now. It's a lifelong endeavor. But even that being said, you've got a degree at, let's say, Dallas after four years. That doesn't necessarily mean you're qualified to be uh, an overseer of a church. Not at all. Not at all. It, your character, it's your level of maturity that is going to determine whether you should be a pastor or not. As I said in the past, in chapter 3, is that just because you have the gift to pass the teacher, it doesn't mean that you're qualified to be running a church, overseeing a church. You have to have Christian character, and you must have a certain level of maturity in order to assume the reins of a church. And one of the problems with in the seminary is you're ordaining men, and then, you know, they most of these, a lot of these guys, they come out of college, and then they go into seminary, and they're green. They don't they know any, they, they, haven't work, they haven't been out in the real, I like to say it, the real world, then I haven't been out there. And, I, and if you look at Paul and Timothy in the early first century church, other pastors trained and ordained men. In our day and age, the seminary is a good for the simple reason I think of uh, uh, basically uh, giving men in, insight to the original languages. Um, but the, you get your th theology from your pastor. That's what the Bible taught. Not from Dallas or Schaefer, and I'm not knocking those places. But you're, you're, the people who are, are training these men and ordaining these men should be the local church, the local assembly. And so what I'm saying is a lot of men are getting into the ministry. You know, they come out of college, they go to school, you seminary, and they make, you know, and then they're out there and they get a church and they're not ready because they don't have a, a, enough maturity and they haven't been serving in the church. As I said before, if you go to seminary, great, I'd be serving in the church at the same time too because that's important because uh, that's how your love for God and love for uh, your fellow Christian grows because you're interacting with the body of Christ. Uh, the more you're around the body of Christ and fellowshipping with him, the more opportunities that you get to operate in love because we, uh, we, uh, we have uh, butt heads many times. How are you going to handle people who are, uh, uh, who are mistreating you or how are you going to handle people who are uh, just uh, annoying people and just don't know how to act and they're very immature? How are you going to handle those people? So, uh, for instance, when uh, uh, Jim Ricard and I, you know, we're out in the business world for years. I mean, I, I didn't get ordained until I was, uh, I came out to Iowa in, in, when I was 39, just to, just before I turned 40. And I was ordained in 1998, I think it was what, 36, 37? So I was, for, you know, from, you know, my 20s through my 30s, you know, I was working different jobs. And so, uh, you know, and, and that's good too because I got to be, not only was I studying in the morning and at night and then over at Bob's, before I went to work, I studied. And then, so I had a long day. I mean, my days would awfully start at 5 o'clock in the morning and end at, you know, 12 o'clock at night. And so, but I was in that church, which was great about being in the church at, at, at Bob's place and with me and Jim, is that we got to serve for many years and people got to see us. And they got to, they got to see uh, the things, our, our weaknesses, our strengths. They get to see our way how we operate with people, and so did Bob. So the, you get a lot of interaction with members of the body of Christ, dealing with problems, dealing with different situations. How did I handle the children in the prep school? You know, how did Jim do? How the other teachers do? And so all that is good because you have to put your Christianity into practice. You're learning, but then you got to take whatever you're learning in your in the classroom. You got to take it out there and you got to put it into practice. That's what's important is how is he putting it into practice? Because if he could have a lot of knowledge of the original language but have absolutely no uh, uh, capacity to be a pastor, he might have a lot of knowledge of the original language, but he hasn't put, had a chance to practice this language, practice the Word of God. And quite frankly, you know, when I first thought, got out of day, you know, you think you, you knew something. But, you know, the more as I go on, I've been, I realize I really didn't, I knew something when I got out of day, but I didn't know this. You know, it's not what you think it is because everybody's, you know, pretty, pretty cocky when they get out of, you know, getting ordained. They think, oh, geez, you know, I passed, you know, I'm doing that. But you, God has a funny way of uh, humbling you. But it, it, this is, I'm, I'm bringing these things up because to, uh, the church is being too hasty in ordaining men to the ministry. And we know that because of all the problems we have, like, with, uh, with in, in the ministry, uh, for, you know, I'm not just talking about men 
who might be immoral or you know, they're, they're carrying on and having an affair. I heard of one pastor, he had multiple, I, I was like, I didn't know this, but it was, there was, he got booted out of a church and, I, and uh, I'd noticed certain individuals who knew this person and he had multiple affairs. I mean, he was basically chasing around women in the church. Like, that's, this guy's like, how did he get in the, in the ministry? And uh, so that's, you know, a lot of times these guys are out there and they should be in these positions. Uh, another thing that I, is also manifested in the fact that some men are being ordained too hastily is how many guys are quitting? You know, I heard of people, of guys, because um, I read a lot of stuff on church splits because I went through one. And I, I was amazed at how many men have, have gone through what I've gone through. And they're so disillusioned and so upset by what they, how they were treated. And they, many, and they did so many things for these people. And the, the people you do you most for hurt you the most. And these guys end up leaving the ministry. They said, I've had it. Well, they, you know, there's a perfect example. The guy has no maturity level. He, he doesn't know how to operate in love. Sure, what do you think Jesus did? You think Jesus quit when they all dis, disobey, uh, went against him? Paul, Peter? The, the, the prophets of Israel, they all get rejected. So here's a pastor, he's got ordained, he gets to a, goes to a church split, and he quits the ministry because of the church split, because of the way people mistreated him. That's a perfect example. That guy's not ready, was never ready for the ministry. And here's another reason why you don't ordain men too hastily. You're hurting them. You're hurting these guys. Like, I mean, there are guys who have had, are, are, like I said, who leave the ministry, who shouldn't have probably been in the ministry in the first place, and these men, they're hurt deeply spiritually. They're scarred deeply. And because they shouldn't have been in the positions that they were in the first place. They were put in the, they were ordained too hastily. And everybody is in a rush. So we need to slow down. We need to take our time. And if you're a man who thinks he's got the gift to pass the teacher, cool your heels, relax. So what if it takes, I mean, so what if it takes to your 50 before you get to be, a, to, to be a, to have your own church? You know, it, it, don't be in a rush. You, it, 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 you know, get prepared. Prepare. That's what I did. Jim and I did. We just prepare, prepare, prepare. And, you know, I was surprised that something came up to me because I figured it would be a while. But it, it came up, and God is full of surprises. So evidently he thought I was ready, and, I, and, and, we, and you go through it. But uh, if I wasn't ready for the ministry, I would have quit the ministry after that church split. I would have walked away if I wasn't ready. I know I wouldn't have. Because I wouldn't have had the, the, I wouldn't been able to the spiritual strength to keep persevering, you know. Now look at verse twenty-four. Look at First, first Timothy chapter five, verse twenty-four. Paul says the sin. Uh, actually, you know, before we look at verse twenty-four, let's pick it up in context. Because look at look at verse seventeen. Let's start off the whole section, in verse seventeen. Read all the way up to verse twenty-five, and then go back to verse twenty-four. I want you to see. The verse 24 in its context. He starts off talking about, in this section, about the proper treatment of elders, as we saw, talking about their remuneration, paying them a salary, paying them for their services and teaching the Word of God. The elders, who, that's the overseers, the past, the teachers, who rule well and consider to be worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. I uh, remember the word preaching, it's, it's uh, actually talking about doctrine itself. Teaching is talking about what the function of teaching the doctrine, the word of God. But notice it's teaching. So these elders are like, uh, they're synonymous with the, they're the same individuals that are called the overseers in chapter 3, because they both teach. Their function is teaching. Now, look what he says. He says that they're he's talking about their, that they should get uh, worthy of double honor. We know that has to do with remuneration because of the next verse. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Then he goes to the next stage about the elders disciplining the elders. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those as who continue to sin, those pastors who are unrepentant after being confronted by the two or three witnesses, you're to rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest may be fearful of sinning. Again, he's following the Lord's procedures in Matthew 18, chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. The, the, the procedure to go through disciplining a person. And as we saw, disciplining an elder and disciplining a person who's not a, a pastor are the same principles. There's no two sets of rules. I don't know why they, some guys pull out that. That's not any ex, They have no exegetical basis for that. Same rules apply to a pastor to discipline him as you would anybody else in the church. 
So then he goes on to say in verse 21, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. That's related to the disciplining of elders. Don't be partial. Don't be biased. Carry out these things with integrity and character. And he's calling Timothy. He's reminding him of his responsibilities. He's going to be held accountable. And the Lord's watching. The Father and the Son and the angels are. Look at verse 22. Now he talks about the ordination of men. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily. Who's the anyone? Men who want to be overseers that have the gift to pass the teacher. And there he says, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Meaning you'll be complicit in their sins if they go into apostasy. Keep yourself free from sin. He'd do that by obeying what he just said. Now we have a parenthetical note. No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine, a little moderation, for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Now, he's saying that to the, remember the, the Ephesians would read this. So the Ephesians, many of whom had drinking problems, as we noted, uh, the, they would be seeing this and knowing that Paul's telling Timothy to use wine for medicinal purposes. Okay, he wasn't drinking wine altogether because he did want, he knew many in Ephesus had a drinking problem. So for the, in operating in love, he didn't assert his right to have a glass of wine while in their presence. So now he's telling that him and the church in Ephesus, this is for medicinal purposes that Timothy's drinking. Look at verse 24. The sins of some men, now he's going right back to verse 22. The sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment, for others their sins follow after. Likewise, also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Now, look at verse 22, and I'll read that, and skip over verse 23, and go right to verse 24 and 25, and you'll see how they're connected together, indicating that verse 23 is an obvious parenthetical note. Do not lay hands on anyone too hastily, verse 22, and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. Verse 24, the sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment for others, their sins follow after. Likewise, also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. So you can see 20, verse 22 fits beautifully with verse 24 because he's picking up the thought of sins of individuals who are in the ministry. And so this is a very important passage, verse 24, because it's going to teach Timothy and the and primarily the church in Ephesus, the leadership there, be very cautious in ordaining men because some men's sinful lifestyles don't appear until later on. That's why you need to be around them for a period of time because if you're not, uh, they can hide. The, these things might not show up. If you are, he's in your ministry for two years and you ordain him, that's insanity and stupidity. And I've heard of pastors ordaining men because they gave, the guy gave you money. So they ordain the guy. They know nothing about the guy. In fact, the guy lives my, uh, halfway across the country and they're ordaining this guy. He has no contact with this guy. I would never ordain a man when I have no contact with him at all personally. Not at all. You'll be, you're insane to do that as a pastor if you're ordaining a man. You're going to get disciplined by God. One, for being irresponsible in doing that. Two, if the guy ends up going into apostasy and hurting the body of Christ and dishonoring the cause of Christ, then you're going to be complicit in his sins, is what Paul's teaching. Now look at verse 24. He says, the sins of some men are quite evident. That phrase is composed of the genitive uh, plural, masculine plural, indefinite pronouns. Uh, it's the genitive masculine plural form of the indefinite pronoun, tis, which is translated correctly here. Some, it's referring to those men who have the gift to pass the teacher and who aspire to the office of overseer. Then we have the word that it's modifying is the noun, anthropos, translated men. And then we have the articular, nominative, feminine, plural form of the noun, amatia, translated here correctly, the sins. And then we have the nominative uh, form, nominative plural form of the adjective, prodilos, translated here, quite evident. You could translate this conspicuous. And then we have the verb. We have the present active indicative form of the verb emi, which is translated here correctly, are. Now, as Paul's been doing throughout chapter 4 and chapter 5, he's using the fig figure of ascendant time. And, this, and, th and here in verse 24, this emphasizes the importance of this statement in verse 24 with regards to the spiritual well-being of the household of God in Ephesus. So this figure is saying, pay attention to what I'm saying here. This is important to you, Timothy, and to other pastors who are thinking ordaining men. Now, the word amatia, 
is used of those sins committed by men who aspire to the office of overseer. Paul's describing these sins as very obvious and not obvious in this passage. Uh, it says in verse 24, the sins of some men are quite evident. Some of those sins are, 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 are uh, conspicuous, going before them to judgment. And for others, their sins follow after them, meaning that they're not so evident immediately. Now, let me make this clear because uh, it's so important. Notice, he doesn't say what type of sin. He doesn't say the sin of adultery. He doesn't say the sin of murder. He doesn't say the sin of lying or homosexuality. He doesn't say any of those sins. He doesn't identify the sin. Why? Because the Paul and the God, the Holy Spirit, now the whole Trinity, all sin is an abomination to God. You know the scriptures say abomin lying is an abomination, just like it says homosexuality. You, you got Christians banging on uh, on the whole idea with homosexuality, yet they are liars themselves. They're an abomination when they lie. So all sin is an abomination to God because all sin is contrary to His perfect holiness, His character and nature. So therefore, the sin, so this tells us something: you can't remove a guy or not ordain a guy because of a particular sin. And what I brought up in the past. Moses, a murderer. We're going to study that in Exodus. He was a believer. David was a believer, murder and adultery. Peter was a believer, and he denied the Lord three times. Cursed while he said, I don't know the damn guy. So we see, and he was, more, he was, more, uh, was much more graphic than that language. He's a fisherman, you know. And uh, so he, here we have Peter denied the Lord. So was Peter still in the did Peter still go and stay in the ministry? Did David still be king? Is it, was he still king of Israel? Did Moses not go on to lead God's people? Absolutely. But we got a lot of legalistic teaching out there who think that certain sins can remove men to the, from the ministry. The only thing that can cause a man to be removed from his pulpit, and this is tr being true of all Christians, they can be removed from the fellowship of the church, be disciplined by the church, and this is why. Unrepentant sin. Let me give you an example. Let's say the guy's having an adulterous affair. If he doesn't stop it, and you confront him, and he doesn't stop it, and he continues going, the church should go the next step and, have, and, go, and bring the witnesses. Then the next step after that, if he doesn't uh, listen to the rebuke of the entire church, and he continues forward, get him out of the, uh, throw him out of the fellowship of the church, just like he would anybody else. Just like the Lord said in Matthew 18. If, and if you, so this is what we see. Unrepentant sin. Now the sins he's talking about here, are a lifestyle. Because every, it's not talking about sporadic sin. I made this example, you know, let's say I'm out, I'm out with the, uh, the Thompsons driving around, and, you know, uh, let's say uh, somebody, uh, a, a, a cow cuts me off, and I go, you damn cow! You know, I start crying, you know, cursing and swearing at the cow. And all the kids would say, pass the bill, we got to remove him from the pulpit! He's cursing and swearing. It's like sporadic sin, the guy had a bad day, maybe, I mean, who knows? But, I'm not saying you should do that, I'm not condoning that, but what I am saying is, it's a lifestyle. He's, for instance, alcoholism. To be an alcoholic, you have to be drinking as a lifestyle. It's an habitual sin. You can't become an alcoholic by having one drink or getting drunk once. You we are an alcoholic because you, alcoholic because you consistently, habitually abuse alcohol. That's what I'm talking about. Something like that, because all men in the ministry sin. And if you don't think so, then you're, you just don't know the testimony of Scripture. Everybody's got a sin nature, including the man behind the pulpit. So we see that the sins here, it's talking about something that's a lifestyle, not sporadic sinning. This is something that he's been doing, and he's been doing it as a, an habitual thing, as a lifestyle. So these sins, now here's another thing. I, I sit in here when I study this passage, pretty interesting. These sins are all related to the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1-7. through 7. Remember, he gave those qualifications so they, they could determine who's qualified to be a pastor, or overseer of a church, and who's not. Hold your place. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Very important. Because these qualifications are tied to what Paul's saying in 1 Timothy 5, 24 and 25 and 22. Because they're going to help Timothy and the church in Ephesus to determine who should be a pastor and who's not. Those qualifications are the litmus test. Okay? Now, some of these these qualifications, these qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, which we're going to look at briefly, 
are, were given to help Timothy in the Ephesian church to determine which men with a spiritual gift to pass the teacher and who aspire to the office of overseer should be ordained and hold this office and which should not. Failure to meet many, not all, of these qualifications would constitute sinning. Therefore, the candidate who consistently does not meet these qualifications is disqualified. doesn't mean he can't be qualified later on. It just means at that moment he can't be qualified. He's not qualified. Maybe later on he'll grow up. Now look at 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. As I said before, if the man doesn't meet these qualifications consistently, and some of them, are by not doing so, meeting these qualifications, are, you're sinning. I'll show you why. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Look at verse 1. It's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach. First qualification. The husband of one, actually it's the title for the rest of them too. The husband of one wife, that means he's a one woman man. Now, that means he's faithful to his wife. Now, if he's not faithful to his wife, it doesn't keep, if he doesn't meet this qualification, it means he's not faithful to his wife, disqualified. Then it says, then he can't be ordained. Uh, temperate, that word that talks about uh, level headedness, that means, he, uh, that word there means he, he shows moderation and is sober in his thinking. Well, if he, if he disobeys, if he doesn't meet this qualification of being temperate and level-headed, that means he is, uh, he's not showing moderation in all things, and he's not sober in his thinking. He's an emotional individual. The next one, it says he has to be prudent. Now, the word prudent there, as we saw, was wise. Now, that means he has, he has control over his emotions. Well, if, you don't, if he's not doesn't meet this qualification, that would imply he doesn't have control over his emotions. Then it says respectable. That means he's responsible. Well, if he doesn't meet that qualification, he's irresponsible. Let's say he's lousy on his job, his job during the day. He's, he's always late. He's, he's, uh, he, he's mouthed off to his boss. All right? He's irresponsible. Or he doesn't take care of his family. Irresponsible. He doesn't meet that qualification. He's not going to get an ordain. See what? Follow me there? Now look at it says next one. Hospitable. That's self-explanatory. If he's not hospitable, he's sinning. Because Romans 12, 13 is a command to be hospitable. Able to teach. Well, that's not, he's not sinning if he doesn't, uh, if, he, uh, if he can't teach. It just means that he doesn't, have, he doesn't have that gift. And so he's not sinning if he's not able to teach. He's just manifesting the fact that he doesn't have the gift. Then look at it says in verse 3, not addicted to wine. If he's addicted to wine, if he doesn't meet that qualification, that means he's addicted to wine. He's an alcoholic, not qualified, can't ordain him. Pugnacious. That means he's not violent. Well, if he's violent, he's disqualified. If he, can't, if he doesn't meet this qualification, he's a, he's a violent pr person, and therefore he's not qualified. See how the, the sins he's talking about in 1 first, first Timothy 5.24 are connected to this? Because this was given to help them, Timothy and the church in Ephesus, to determine who's qualified and who's not to be a pastor. Okay? Now look at, he goes on to say, he says, uh, he, he said, not addicted to wine in verse 3, or pugnacious. Now, what does that mean to be pugnacious? It means to be uh, content. Uh, that means to be, uh, to be uh, pugnacious. Uh, he's talking about a fighter. So if he's a fighter, he's not qualified. Then it says gentle. That means he's, uh, he's magnanimous. That means he doesn't get involved in petty, pettiness. And, he's not, uh, and he's, uh, he's not unforgiving. Well, if he breaks this and he's not gentle, that means he's petty, he holds grudges, and he's unforgiving. Not qualified. Next of all, peaceable. That means, actually, it means not contentious. That means he's, uh, the word means you're not argumentative. And you're not combative. So, therefore, if he is argumentative, he's not qualified. Then it says he's free from the love of money. Well, if he loves money, he's disqualified. Paul talks about that in chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. No, chapter 6. He talks about in verses 3 through 10 that some, he tells the, says that the apostate pastors in Ephesus loved money. That's why they taught false doctrine. Let's go on further. Let's not get off track on that. He must be, verse 4, he must be one who manages his own household well, meaning he, well means he does it according to God's words, the standards of God's word, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? He won't be able to. So if he doesn't manage his household 
according to the standards of God's word, he's not qualified. Okay? Because if he's not managing his own household according to the standards of God's word, he's not going to do it with the church. Look at verse 6. And not a new convert. That's not a sin. But he's a new convert. And so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. If he doesn't have a good reputation outside the church, that's because he has a problem. He's not a, he doesn't have any character and integrity. And I'm saying, um, I know some people, unbelievers, might have a bad attitude that's not justified. But we're talking about something that they have a just, their attitude toward him is justified. He doesn't have a good reputation because he's earned the bad reputation. So notice that not meeting these qualifications, many of them, constitutes sin. That's why Paul gave this list. Because in 1 Timothy 5.24, which you can go back to, when he says the sins of some men, the word sins there is referring to the sins that are, are the result of not meeting these quali- many of these qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7. So look at verse 24. The sins of some men are quite evident. Now the word uh, some, that's the indefinite pronoun tis. It refers to those men with a spiritual gift to pass the teacher and who aspire to the office of overseer without further identification. The word men, that refers again to these men with the gift to pass the teacher and who aspire to the office of overseer and have an unrepentant sinful lifestyle that is either evident to the church or is not. I say unrepentant lifestyle because it's not talking about sporadic sinning. It's talking about something like he's an alcoholic. He's habitually abusing alcohol. That's the idea. Now, the word functions, this word anthropos, functions as a genitive of production, which which indicates that Paul is saying that the sins produced by some men are obvious. So you could translate this phrase, uh, the sins of some men are quite evident. Some men, you could translate it, the the sins produced by some men or committed by some men are quite evident. Now, the word for quite evident, remember that's the word prodilos, and that word uh, is used of the sins of some men with a spiritual gift to pass the teacher who aspire the office of overseer, and it describes their sins as very obvious or conspicuous or easy to see. Some guys, it's easy to see they're not ready for the ministry. They're not ready to be a pastor. Their inventory behavior, their, uh, their, their, the things that they, they there's certain still a uh, measure of growth for them. So you just say, you, you say, well, not, they're not ready yet. Now, maybe five years down the road, the guy grows up and he's ready. But the whole point is, we've got to let this guy, just because, let's say, he could go and he stands in and he can teach the Word of God really well, skillful. If his character doesn't measure up, don't put him, don't ordain him. Just because he can go up there and he speaks great, he's a great teacher and he has a good grasp of the Word of God, and he might be skillful in the original language, that doesn't mean he's ready to teach the, take, take the reins of the church. His character has to be there. Now look at the, let's look, keep going, let's uh, go on, let's keep going on in verse 24. He says, the sins of some men, or produced by some men, or committed by some men, are obvious and conspicuous. Then he says something interesting, which is, um, it's, it's kind of interesting how misinterpreted this is, this next phrase. Going before them to judgment. Now, that phrase, going before them to judgment, is a few words in the Greek, three words actually. We have the participle form of the verb proago, translated going before. And then we have the prepositional phrase, the preposition is, and its object is the noun krisis. Now, this verb that's translated going before, it's used in a figurative, intransitive, that means it doesn't have a, doesn't have a direct object, temporal sense, and it means to lead. And it denotes that the sins committed by some men who aspire to the office of overseer are conspicuous, leading to discipline from the church. Not Judgment. Now, some people say hey, condemnation, eternal condemnation. Now, think about this. When it says the sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment. Now, does judgment, some say, eternal condemnation. How could that be? Who's he talking about? He's talking about men who are Christians, who want to be pastors over churches. And we know a Christian doesn't go to the great white throne judgment to be judged. He goes to the Bema seat where his sins are never mentioned. So some argue that the word precede or go before the judge 
Some argue that the word means proceed or go before the judgment. This judgment for Christians is called the Bema Seat. So when he says, going before then the judgment, which judgment? The judgment of the church, which is actually an evaluation. Sins are never brought up. Hold your place. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. So this is where you pay attention. Who is he talking to? Who is he talking about? Believers. Men who want to be overseers. So they don't go to the great white throne judgment. No believer does. And they go to the Bema seat. And their sins are never brought up. So what, what's the judgment talking about? Talking about discipline. Whether from the church or from God himself. Look at it says in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? So that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body. According to what he has done, whether good or bad. The word bad there means worthless. It's talking about your works. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We, we know that because of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.11-15. through 15. Look at 1 Corinthians 3.11. First Corinthians 3.11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident for the day when you stand before Christ, will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. He's going to judge it. He's going to judge your works, whether they're divine in quality or not, not divine in quality. And the fire itself will test the quality was your works done in the power of the Spirit, divine in quality, or were they done in the power of the flesh? And each of the, the, he will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. And if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer the loss of his salvation? No! How do we know that? Because he says next thing, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, that, so this, when it says, going before, go back to 1 Timothy 5.24. Hopefully you held your place. When Paul says the sins of some men are quite evident, going before them the judgment, the judgment's talking about the Bema seat. And the Bema seat is an evaluation of the believer's stewardship of his time, talent, and treasure and truth. A believer's sins are never brought up at the Bema seat. Why? Because the sins are nailed to the cross. He disciplines for us for sin. God disciplines us because we're his children. But they're not going to be brought up again, held against us at the, at the great white throne. It's going to be whether we were faithful stewards with the time, talent, and treasure and truth that God gave us. So this will be a time, the Bema Seat, to evaluate the believer's stewardship of their time, talent, treasure, and truth to determine if they were faithful or unfaithful. Therefore, to say that this word proago, going before the judgment, speaks of the sins committed by some men who aspire to the office of overseer, are conspicuous going before them the judgment is incorrect based upon the fact that the believer's sins are never mentioned in the Bema Seat. So what, he say, what is he saying? It's actually saying judgment there is speaking of discipline, whether it's from the church, but they're a sinful lifestyle that's obvious, you're going to confront the guy, or the Lord's going to discipline them. So this verb, proago, which translated, which translated here, going before, this word proago actually, actually means leading to. It speaks of the sins committed by some men who aspire to the office of overseer, that they're conspicuous, going before them the judgment. It means to lead to judgment, excuse me. It, it said, it's speaking of the sins. It means to lead in the sense that the sins committed by some men who aspire to the office of overseer are conspicuous, leading to judgment, i.e. disciplinary action taken by the church against the candidate. So don't miss that. Look at it says in verse 24. And I'll throw it in what it should say. The sins of some men are quite evident. Leading to judgment, to discipline. We could translate it. Better word, discipline. Punishment. That means disciplinary action from the church or from God. Now this word is a result participle. That means that the sins committed by some men who aspire to the office of overseer are conspicuous. Consequently, with the result that they lead to discipline. Don't miss that. It says the sins of some men are quite evident. Then you can translate it. So that with a result that it leads to discipline. You got it? Pretty, it makes much more sense there. 
So this word, krisis, judgment, it's used in relation to the conspicuous sins committed by those men with the gift to pass the teacher and who aspire to the office of overseer, and it means discipline, referring to the punishment that these men will receive through church discipline or discipline from God. It speaks of those the actions taken by the church against these men for their sinful lifestyles. It refers to a public uh, to a public rebuke by the church if they do not repent after being confronted by the testimony of two or three witnesses of their sin, and it also can refer to being removed from the fellowship of the church because of not repenting from the sin after being rebuked by the entire church. Look at Romans, uh, Matthew 18. Let me show you this. Because in, in 1 Timothy 5, 19-20, Paul was following the Lord's procedure for church discipline. That's recorded in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Now look at Matthew 18, 15. Matthew 18, 15. Because this is what Paul will be using with regards to these men who want to be in the ministry. So let's say some guy's a drunkard, an alcoholic, and he wants to be a pastor. He's an alcoholic, and it turns up that he, he's abusing alcohol and it's obvious to the church. What do you do about him? Well, this is the procedure. It says in, in Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. So he says, yeah, yeah I got a drink of problem, and he gets cleaned up. He cleans up his act, and, he, and he's, uh, he gets uh, on the wagon, and he's all set. Good. He's, he's, he, you don't have to do anything further. However, if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that the mouth, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. They call it intervention with some people, but you're taking these people, and they, they, they're witnesses of the fact that you're an alcoholic, and you confront them, okay? If he refused to listen to them, tell it to the church. And say, oh my gosh, you can't, I thought we're supposed to be privacy. Not what this says, because you're trying to get the guy to stop what he's doing. It's called pressure. The pressure of the whole church on him is going to, see, this flies in the face of what a lot, I've been taught many times, in the, in the face of a lot of guys who are teaching today. They ignore this. We're to do this. Okay? And it's good for them, because then they, so it embarrasses them. Maybe they'll stop. And if they don't, they're arrogant, and they're going to be disciplined by the God, because they get kicked out of the fellowship of the church. Now, that's what Paul would say about Alexander and Hymenaeus. He handed them over to Satan. Alexander and Hymenaeus wouldn't stop teaching false doctrine. He kicked them out of the fellowship of the church. They didn't want to stop. And they were confronted by him. You can count on it. Because he practiced what he taught. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even to the church, let him to be to you as a tax collector and a Gentile. Don't even have any association with him. That's church discipline. Paul taught that in 1 Corinthians 5. In 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 2, after the guy repented, he said, bring him back in. So if we don't practice it with not just pastors but the whole church, we're not, we're doing we're not help, we're not we're not on the Lord's side. We're on the devil's side. I'll tell you right now, because we to reflect the holiness of God, the character of Christ in our lives, and we can't, especially from our leaders, we can't tolerate you know sinful lifestyles. You know the guys uh, uh, having uh, multiple affairs. Uh, he's a, an alcoholic. This is killing the ministry. It's killing the body of Christ, and it's killing the testimony of the church. No wonder the church's reputation is shot in America in many, in many circles. Now, look at 1 Timothy. Go back to 1 Timothy 5.24, please. First Timothy 5.24, the sins of some men, some men who want to be overseers, that want to get ordained, are quite evident, obvious, with the result that it leads to discipline from the church. For others, this is, key, this is interesting, their sins follow after. Now, that last phrase, for others, their sins follow after, is composed of, once again, the, date, the indefinite pronoun, tis, translated for others. Then we have the conjunction, the, post positive conjunction, the, and then we have, it's not translated, by the way, and it's used with a conjunction, ke, which is not translated by the New American Standard either. I don't know why. I'd have to ask them, but it should be. They don't even translate it. Those two words are not even translated in your, I don't know what the Net Bible uh, says, but the, uh, this, the New American Standard didn't translate these two words, and that's a shame because they're emphatic. Then we have the verb. We have the present active indicative form of the verb, epikolutheo. That's translated, follow after. Now, the two words that I say that are not translated, 
they present an emphatic contrast. They present an emphatic contrast. Let me read you my translation, which reflects these two words in the translation. Look at verse, listen to verse 24 from my translation. The sins committed by some men are conspicuous with the result that they, as an eternal spiritual truth, lead to discipline. However, indeed, keh and death, those two words. However, indeed, you could translate it. He said, and then it goes on to say, however, indeed, for the detriment of some, they, as an eternal spiritual truth, show up later, these sayings. So, however, indeed, is how you should translate these words. So, if you look at verse 24, I'll throw them in here for the, for the New American Standard, which is a literal translation. The sins of some men are quite evident, with the result that it leads to discipline. However, indeed, for others, their sins follow after. Paul's being emphatic here. Now, the, the word that's translated others, the indefinite pronoun tis, is used as a substantive, and it refers to those men with the gift to pass the teacher who aspire to be overseers in a church. It speaks of these men without naming any individuals. It's used without further identification. Now, the word epakolutheo, ep, epakolutheo, which is translated here in your Bibles, uh, follow after, it means to appear later, indicating that Paul is teaching that the sins of some men who aspire to the office of overseer are conspicuous. However, indeed, the sins of some men show up later or appear later on in their lives. So this word's teaching a principle, listen to me, and it's true. A principle taught in Numbers 32, 23, that your sin will eventually find you out. So if you're carrying on, and this guy's carrying on, he's saying, and he wants to be a pastor, and he's carrying on, let's say he's an alcoholic, or let's say he's a terrible father and he beats his wife or something, or beats his kids or whatever, or he's, you know, he's very irresponsible, he's bad on his job, eventually that's going to show up. His sin will find him out. I mean, a lot of times we think of immorality, but we, or, or we think of like sexual sins, but this is talking about something that's, you're, an unre you're having a certain little compartment of your life. You see, a lot of people do, lead some leaders do this too. Uh, John Kennedy did this in his life. He com 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 uh, compartmentalized certain things. I got that out. In his life. He was a great leader, but he had a terrible personal life. He, so he, had un he was unfaithful to his wife, and he did a lot of disservice to his, to his, fa his family. And this never showed up until after he was after he's dead, because back then they never said anything. They kept these things under wraps. Today, everybody throws the dirty laundry out there in the media. He'd never be able to get away with the things he did. But he was, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, Dave, King David was the same way. Great leader, but he had a lot of problems. And he had a terrible father. Absalom is a perfect example of that. He was a spoiled little brat. Absalom was a pain. David didn't, well, David wasn't a good father. He wasn't. He had all these multiple women. God said to the, to the kings of Israel, don't do that. So David's another guy, but he compartmentalized a lot of stuff in his life too. So eventually your sin's going to find you out. That's what happened with King David. With uh, Bathsheba and the fact that he murdered Uriah the Hittite and he covered it up and as if it's not going to show up later on. It sure did. God sent the prophet Nathan to deal with him, to confront him. David was unrepentant. That's why he got disciplined. He was hiding it. He never went to God and said, yeah, Lord, I did this and murdered the guy. He should have gone to God when he got her pregnant and then God would have done something. But he, he, he because he was unrepentant, covered it up, he, his sins multiplied. And then he ends up murdering the guy. Because he just didn't go clean, come clean with God. So this verb, apa kulutheko, going out and following after, it teaches that eventually a sinful lifestyle will show itself in a man's life. So if a guy's got a drinking problem, it's going to show up, he's saying. He might be able to hide it for one or two years from you. But if he's in the church for five, ten years, that's going to show up. It's going to show up. It's going to manifest itself. It's going to come out. It all comes, it always comes out. Now, as we come to the end here, as we noted, you know, why did Paul say the things he said here in verse 24? He's, uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, Timothy 5.24, Paul's uh, presenting the basis for his prohibition in verse 22. Didn't I tell you that? He, in verse 24, remember he said in verse 22, he said, don't ordain men too hastily. Then he gives a reason, because you'll be complicit in their sins. Two, in verse 24, he gives a second reason. He says that some men, their sins are obvious, 
going leading to judgment, but others they sins follow after. Meaning, don't ordain men too hastily because, you, you know, if you do that, you can, the things that might be going on in their lives won't show up because you're ordaining them too hastily. Give it time. Be cautious. Give it time. If they're doing something wrong, it'll show up. If he's doing something right, it's going to show up. Be cautious. But if you rush to ordain these guys, you're going to miss these things. And you're going to hurt him, him man, and you're going to hurt the church, and you're going to hurt the testimony of the church, and you're going to disgrace the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we noted, as we close, the Apostle Paul, in verses 17 through 25 of 1 Timothy 5, instructs Timothy as to the proper treatment of elders. In this pericope, this paragraph, Paul is attempting to give discernment directly to Timothy and indirectly to the Ephesian church, who would have read this letter, or would have this letter read to them or read it themselves. In verses 17 and 18, as we saw, he addresses the subject of remuneration of elders. Verses 19 through 21, he addresses the subject of disciplining elders. In verse 22, he commands Timothy not to ordain men too hastily, thus not being complicit in their sins. Thus, by doing so, he would keep himself pure. Verse 23, as we noted, is a parenthetical note addressing Timothy's health. And after this parenthetical note, here in verse 24, he returns to the subject of not ordaining men too hastily by presenting the basis for that prohibition. In verse 24, Paul teaches that the sins of some of these men are quite evident in that they lead to discipline from the church. However, he also teaches that the sins of some men follow, which means that they're not obvious, but that they will eventually be turn up and be disciplined by the Lord. Therefore, Timothy and the church in Ephesus, the leadership in Ephesus, must be cautious in ordaining men to the ministry. What's the application in our day and age? Obvious. Don't be ordaining men too hastily. Why do we do that? Why do pastors do that? I can give you a couple of reasons why they do it. One, some men ordain men so they can have somebody fill the pulpit so they can go run off to Florida for a few weeks. Some men do it because they want to build an empire. Some men do that. They're looking to build an empire. They're not thinking about the Lord. They're not thinking about the candidate. They're not thinking about the body of Christ, who they're hurting if they put some guy in a position who doesn't know what he's talking about. There are some men that, you know, they might have good Christian character, but they don't know how to interpret their Bible. How are they getting behind the pulpit? Because false doctrine comes from bad interpretive skills, bad hermeneutical principles. If the man does not know, not know how to teach the Bible or te uh, uh, study the Bible and interpret it, how can he teach the church? He can't. He can't. And let me tell you another thing. Be very wary of men who do topical studies. Because at that, you can, those guys ride hobby horses, many of them. And what happens is they're not going through the different books of the Bible and they're passing over a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of passages of Scripture. And the reason why they do that is because, one, they might not have the interpretive skills they're hiding. They can't exegete a book because they don't know how to do it. Maybe some of them don't have the gift, and maybe some of them have the gift, and they're too darn lazy to go into the original languages. So therefore, topical studies, they can just regurgitate their notes instead of just, you know, when you're forced to do a book, I can't skip over anything. i got to go, I'm going through every single word. I'm going through the whole text. I have to do that. You can't skip around that. If you do topical studies, you can skip around passages. See how they do that? That's what happens. So, in verse 25, which we're going to see next Tuesday, the Apostle teaches that in direct contrast to the obvious sins of some men, the good deeds of some men are also obvious, which demonstrate that they're qualified to be an overseer. However, the good deeds performed by others are not so obvious, but will show up eventually in a man's life. So therefore, Paul's teaching, Timothy and the ordained pastors in Ephesus, who would also be involved in the process of ordaining men, that some candidates might not appear to be qualified, but in fact are. Therefore, verse 25 is connected to verse 24. And these verses, Paul's killing two birds with one stone. First, he wants to give Timothy and the pastors in Ephesus discernment with regards to choosing those who are qualified and those who are not. Secondly, he wants to give them encouragement because it's not always obvious as to who's qualified and who is not. So therefore, Paul's instructing them to be cautious in ordaining men and not ordaining men. Being cautious in ordaining men will allow time for their sinful lifestyle to surface, which disqualifies them to be overseers. On the other hand, it would also allow time for the good deeds of some to surface as well, which would qualify them to be 
focusing it. So all of it comes down is this. Be cautious. Take your time. Why the rush? Why the rush? Well, let's close the prayer. Close, close in prayer. And then we'll have our prayer meeting. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with the things that we heard. Help us to understand and apply what we've heard. And to understand that we must be cautious in ordaining men to the ministry. That the church must be aware of this. Pastors and the members of their congregation must be aware of this. For the sake of the spiritual growth of these men who have the gift to pass the teacher. For the sake of the spiritual well-being of the church. And for the testimony of uh, the church before the unsaved. So help us to put these things into practice that we've learned here this evening. We pray for these things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's take a few minute break and then we'll have a prayer meeting. You're all invited.